ever since uh, Blue Planet 2, we've talked a lot about plastic in our oceans. Is it reversible? It's a huge question, isn't it? It's an issue which has been highlighted a lot on this programme, and I know a lot of you, uh, whenever we talk about it, you all get involved in that discussion. Mm. Our next guest is well placed to help answer lots of questions. Uh, Emily Penn is a British skipper and Sky Ocean Rescue Ambassador who's just returned from a one month all female fact finding expedition from Hawaii to Seattle, and part of the trip involved sailing through the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which, as we'll soon see, unfortunately lived up to its reputation. Emily, tell us, I mean, you know, so much to ask about. Tell us about this, um, I mean, this garbage patch. It sounds horrific. It was. Um, you know, it really did kind of change the mood on the boat as we sailed into this area. It took us actually five days from Hawaii before we then started seeing large amounts of plastic over mm. the side of the boat. And then we carried on going for seven days, a thousand miles, seeing these bits of plastic passing us by. You brought in um, a few little bits and pieces here. So this is from that patch. This is just a, a sample that you've taken. With, I mean, it's got all sorts of different sizes of plastics in there as well. Exactly. So this is the size that we're focusing on, what we call microplastics, these tiny fragments uh, that start as something bigger. They break down when they get into the ocean. And when you look at the sea, you can't actually see these. But when you take a fine net through the water, we then realise that actually it's covered in these pieces. And you've also got a piece of plastic here, which has got the... Um, this is you know, proof of, of what it's doing to the sea life, because these has got bite marks from, from fish all over this plastic. Exactly. So this is one of the things we're trying to better understand is what is the impact of this plastic on the ocean, on the marine life and on, on the food chain? Um, what I was, I mean, you know, so you, you sailed through this for seven days, this sort of soup of plastic, as far as you describe it. Um, I mean, so many questions about, you know, what can we, it's there. Can we do anything about removing it, clearing it up? So, as you see in these samples, the pieces are so small, and this sample actually equates to half a million pieces of plastic just in one square kilometre. Right. And so, trying to actually fish out these tiny pieces is the most immense challenge, and I'm a big believer that we actually need to be working much closer to the source here on land, stopping the plastic getting into the ocean in the first place. Well, that's the, that's the figure um, from looking into this this morning that really staggers me, is that total volume of plastic we've ever produced is 8.3 billion tonnes, and 6.3 billion tonnes of that is now waste. So, you know, unless, like you say, unless we actually stop producing it, change the way we do things, it's almost a battle you can't win. Exactly. And if it's not going into the ocean, it's still going into landfill or somewhere, which isn't great either. It's this very linear process that we're living in that we need to change. Um, just um, looking at you, you're all female crew. Is there a particular reason why that was? So originally, when I started looking at this issue, I was learning about the chemicals that are on the plastic and in the ocean and tested actually my own blood to find out if I had these chemicals inside me. Did you? It turned out of the 35 we tested for, I had 29 inside my body. And the more I learned about the impact of these chemicals, I learned about these hormone disrupting chemicals that can particularly affect female reproductive health and we can pass them on to our children. So it's quite a female centered health issue. Mm. And so I thought, why not tackle it with a team of amazing women? What about the, on the back of this? Where do you then take this research? I mean, can you sort of present this to, to government? Are we more concerned about this in the UK than, than other countries? Are other countries going through the same sort of process that we're going through? There's definitely a lot of other countries working on this too, but there has been an incredible awareness in the UK over the last 12 months on this issue. Uh, so it's a really great time to be doing this research and really taking things to the next level, L looking at the part that businesses can play, that industry and governments really can play. Um, you talked right at the beginning about the sort of sense of scale of this. Were you shocked? I was shocked. So I've been working on this for 10 years, but we found more plastic in the North Pacific this year than on any of my other voyages. Um, and given, I think, the amount of awareness that's been risen on this issue, mm. um, unfortunately, we're not quite yet seeing that positive influence on, on what's happening to the ocean itself. So we've, we've got a bit of work to do. Mm. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, would you like to take your Thank you. plastic yeah. bits with you and your, fi your fish bit and plastic there? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a subject we do return to here uh, quite a lot on breakfast, and we will again. Thanks very are much. You, you say you've been in the last 10 years. Are you going again? When are you uh, going? Yes. Um, end of next year, we're actually looking at 
We're not still live on it. Yes, we are. We are. We are. Live on it. Oh no! <laughs> okay, um, is it a secret? Okay, a secret. <laughs> um, it is still a secret. Oh, okay, we okay. haven't announced it, but you've got to stand by for. Uh, what, stand what, by. Yeah, we're going to announce it in 2019. What is it? It's going to be big and exciting. Okay, big and exciting news coming soon, but not now. Oops. <laughs> uh, the dry, hot weather is great for holiday makers. That is not a secret. Um, it's taking its toll on farms, though. <laughs> Steph is at one in Cheshire. Am I allowed to say that now, Steph? Are you there? Good morning. <laughs> Good morning to you. Morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm on a dairy farm in the uh, glorious Cheshire weather, but this weather has made it really tough for the farmers here, the prolonged heat wave we've had. And you can really see it because of the colour of the grass here. So that grass normally at this time of year would be much greener and lusher, and that is what the cows would be feeding on. But instead, because it isn't good enough, They've had to bring out hay for them and that's a hay which has gone up in cost because there's such high demand for it at the moment. So these cows are wondering what on earth is going on, not just because a random person off the telly's turned up with a cameraman, uh, but because normally for them they're used to routine, they come in here, they go to the milk parlour, then they head off back to the fields to eat more. But when they're getting out to that grassy field, then there just isn't the food there for them. So then they're coming back in and the farmers are having to rely on the winter feed. So I just want to show you round here so you can see exactly Exactly the level of winter feed they're using. There's a couple of cows here who I think are going to start to edge backwards as I get a bit closer. Sorry, ladies, do you mind it? There we are. They're just heading off. I'll let them go before I get in the way. But just round here, you can see how much the feed stocks have gone down by. So this should normally be right up to the gates, this winter feed. But instead, they're having to use it now to make sure the cows are getting all the nutrition that they need. So the farmer here is worried about what's going to happen in the winter. I'll be talking to him a little bit later on. But first, let's get the news, travel and weather where you are this morning. Where are you going?